In life, there is a soul. And with that soul, there is a voice. If the San Diego Coronado Bay Bridge had a voice, it might have much to say. In the late 60s of the 20th century, Coronado was nothing but a sleepy beach town off the coast of Southern California. It was an isolated, small yet inclusive community where the town stayed for the most part local. But when the Coronado Bay Bridge opened, something changed. Not only did the bridge connect the world to the town of Coronado, but it exposed a few of Coronado's ambitious residents to the world. This is the story about how several Coronado's high school alumni started one of the biggest marijuana operations throughout the 1970s and 80s. It all started with Lance Weber, Coronado High class of 1962. After spending a few years in the Navy, he returned home to surf and party. In the late 60s, he started smuggling small bundles of marijuana from Tijuana to Imperial Beach. He'd put 25 pounds of drugs in a waterproof plastic bag, tie the floaty bag to his waist, and swim a short distance across the border. One night in the summer of 1971, at a beach party, Lance approached Eddie Otero to see if he might be interested in making the swim from Mexico to the U.S. Lance offered Eddie, who was about to start his senior year in high school, $1,000, and Eddie accepted. Lance recruited Eddie because he knew the kid could swim. Nicknamed the Otter, Eddie was a lifeguard and member of Coronado's water polo and swim teams. While he was still in the high school, Eddie made the swim a few more times, with Lance waiting in the car to collect the merchandise. On one midnight swim, Eddie thought he saw a shark. After his close encounter, he convinced Lance to start making drug runs with a small inflatable Zodiac boat. Lance would drive a boat from Tijuana to Coronado State Beach, where a car would be waiting on the strand. They'd exchange a light flashing signal where then the boat would head towards the shore. The pop, motor, and the boat were loaded into the car, and a few seconds later, they were off. Using the boat was safer and allowed to smuggle bigger loads. But to get more drugs, they had to negotiate a deal with their supplier, a guy who they called Joe the Mexican. The only problem was Joe didn't speak any English, and they needed someone who could speak Spanish. Enter Lou Villar. Lou Villar had been a popular Spanish teacher and coach at Coronado High. After a few years at Coronado, he quit teaching. He married one of his students, bought a VW bus, and started painting houses. Lance, Eddie, and Lou went to the Long Bar in Rosarito, where they met Joe the Mexican, who agreed to sell them 100 kilos. With more product, they needed additional people to help load and unload the boat. So Lou started to recruit his old students from Coronado High, including a former senior class president and the captain of the basketball team. It didn't take long for Lou, the oldest person in the group, to take charge of the operation. They soon bought bigger boats and smuggled in loads as large as 30,000 pounds. They started calling themselves the Coronado Company. Over the next 10 years, they built an empire earning over $100 million by smuggling drugs into the country from Mexico, Thailand, Morocco, and Pakistan. For a decade, they lived the good life, buying expensive houses, luxury cars, and joining exclusive polo clubs. But Coronado is a small place, and people talk. Sergeant Dennis Grimo of Coronado's police department started hearing rumors about high school kids smuggling drugs from Mexico. He notified DEA Special Agent James Conklin, who started to build a case against the Coronado Company. In 1977, the U.S. government issued an indictment for 25 members of the Coronado Company. However, they moved to Santa Barbara to avoid capture and lived under false identifications to continue smuggling for another four years. When Lou refused to pay a contractor working on his house $50,000, the builder tipped off federal authorities about the true identity of his employer. In 1981, Lou and several members of the Coronado Company were arrested in Santa Barbara.
What did you find on them the day that you people picked them up? About $800,000 in cash. Close to uh, half a ton of tie sticks in one of the houses that we searched. Philip DeMassa, a San Diego defense attorney, represented Lou. DeMassa advised Lou to plead guilty, and he received a 10-year sentence. But Lou didn't like prison, and he cut an unusual deal with the U.S. attorney. DeMassa was a lawyer with a reputation for successfully representing drug dealers. The U.S. attorney suspected DeMassa was more of a criminal than a criminal defense attorney and wanted to bring a case against him. So Lou offered the government information they could use against his former lawyer. As part of Lou's deal, he also agreed to testify against his old students. DeMassa was arrested, and the government seized the files for his criminal clients. A judge declared the search of DeMassa's office unconstitutional and the case against him fell apart. He pleaded guilty to a few minor charges, served no jail time, and continued to practice law. He died during a scuba diving accident in 2012. Many of Lou's former students who were part of the Coronado Company were not as lucky as DeMassa, and they spent years in federal prison based on their former Spanish teacher's testimony. Lance Weber became a government informant in exchange for a reduced sentence. He died of Lou Gehrig's disease in 2000. Eddie Otero received a 10-year sentence. However, during a prison riot, he saved a guard's life and was released three years earlier. After prison, he started a successful air and water purification business in Palm Springs. He died while tuna fishing off the coast of Mexico in 2013. Lou Villar, the former Spanish teacher turned drug king, was resentenced after providing information against his attorney and former students. He served less than two years in prison and was allowed to keep most of the profits from his drug operation. Nobody knows where Lou Villar is today or if he's even still alive, but in 2013 at the age of 76, he sat down with a reporter from GQ magazine. He was asked if he'd do it all again, where he said he would. Who says crime doesn't pay?